Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or haven't uh, seen me at one of these events before, my name is Liam O'Sullivan. Uh, for my sins, I'm the program director for a large project in London called Low Carbon London. And we should get some decks up in a minute. Uh, so I've been invited here today, which I do thank Market Force for, and also for your good selves to listen to me, to, for some of you, I suppose, give you an introduction to the Low Carbon London program. Uh, for some others to give you an update um, on the actual project itself. So the project is a low carbon network fund uh, inspired project. It is a circa 30 million pound project lasting four years and we're more or less at the midpoint um, uh, this year. So we have another two years to run. And the project is principally about looking at low carbon technologies impact on a power network and obviously centered on London uh, as an area um, for the project. And I hear you ask why London, and I'll go through that a little bit with you. But just a little bit of, uh, of context. So UK Power Networks uh, is a relatively new distribution network operator operating in the UK. We are responsible for London and the two networks which were known as Eastern and Southern. Two years old, approximately. Uh, and uh, even I do say so myself, one of the larger, and obviously operating in London uh, gives you a lot of excitement and a lot of issues to deal with uh, that perhaps other areas experience, but perhaps not to the same grade and level. I just want to emphasise we're not a retailer, so we're not EDF Energy anymore. We are actually a DNO, which is a very refreshing place to be, and especially if you're a budding engineer like myself. Uh, and I know I don't look 25, but I'm not so far away. Um, so Low Carbon London is a collaboration, so the key point about the project, it is a collaboration with industry experts, with government, with customers, and that's really a key thing in relation to the challenges of future power networks, and I'll, you'll see a theme in this presentation, also the one I give later on around customers. Um, so a bit of background, so why London? So it, it is actually the ideal case study. So Low Carbon London, as it suggests, is looking at low carbon technologies uh, allowing and enabling customers to connect those technologies to our network uh, and all of that that goes with that. So London is a dense network. It, it is one of the uh, areas of the country which has the, the highest CO2 output. Um, but actually, it also has a lot of good backing from the mayor in terms of wanting to do something about that, but also around embedded generation and enabling and releasing DG embedded within our network. One, to provide us with uh, support for our network, but also to... Um, to reduce carbon output. So what comes with that are indeed some challenges, but also indeed some opportunities. I won't dwell on every slide, and I won't read every slide, but the, the pack will be available, and my apologies for not getting it to you beforehand. So this, if you can have a look at this slide, it kind of gives you the centre of London, which is a little bit to the west, but also the new centre of London, which is slightly to the east. So there is, a, there is another backdrop to this, and that's really about load growth. So load growth in London tends to be quite steady. And if, and again, I, this is one of the challenges, if the low carbon revolution does take off, uh, we expect to see some major challenges in relation to that. Has it taken off yet? No. Um, and I'll go through some of that within the programme. But I have a, 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 I have a view that it will take off in certain areas. And I'll talk a little bit around electric vehicles, but also around DG. But again, just to set the context uh, in, in managing the challenges of the network. So Low Carbon London, it actually is a true smart grid project. So it's not just looking at smart meters or EVs or DG. It's actually looking at each one of those areas as a combined grid impact. Um, so we are looking at smart meters, resident time of use tariffs. I'll talk some more about that. Electric vehicle demand uh, and regulating charging of electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. Heat pump demand. So in London, that's a curious thing. There's not a lot of land in which to put heat pumps, but there are, there are a number, both industrial and, and some commercial and residential. Small scale embedded generation, so the like of PV, small scale CHP and actually larger scale CHP as well. Uh, distributed generation, both from an active network managed perspective, but also from a demand response premise. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And demand response in, in a true sense, both residential, but also INC. Wind twinning, which is looking at an available low carbon source of supply at lower cost uh, and enabling customers to take advantage of that. But also again, understanding what impact that might have on our network and the program seeks to challenge us and actually challenge our network as to how it operates. And of course, the big thing, as you all know, with DNO networks, the LV network, we really can't see it. So we can see the EHV network, extra high voltage. We can see the high voltage network. We really can't see the LV network. 
It's still relatively in there somewhere, but not potentially visible. And again, a lot of emphasis of the project is to better understand how we get better connectivity models of our network and how we can better see the LV network. Uh, so starting off with smart metering, it's a, an 18 month trial. Uh, started about six months ago. What are we looking to do? Understand the impact of customers on the network and their interaction with a smart meter. How smart meters can better inform network operation. How we can better visualize that network, as I talked about before. Um, but also, another aspect of the smart metering trial was actually to enable us to run quite a detailed and intensive uh, time of use trial, which I'll talk about as well. So delivery strategy, we've installed about 7,500 smart meters. Sounds a small number. Whenever you're at the beginning of the smart meter rollout, I can tell you that the effort required, especially from an opt-in premise, was very enlightening. And so we're out there. Our two partners, EDF Energy and British Gas, have both installed smart meters for us. Um, EDF Energy about 6,000, British Gas currently about 1,000 and a half, although we have a potential for another 10,000 meters to come into the trials in terms of that network visibility premise. So again, uh, there's a great potential there in terms of understanding better our network from a customer's perspective to manage faults, but also from a load flow, load planning, load management perspective. So some successes, that'll be the one on the left, and then obviously, sorry, the one on the right, I keep making that mistake. And of course, then the one on the right is the real world. So this is a real, a, a real example of what we discovered when the guys went out to try and fit a smart meter. Which one, Gov? There's a few here. So that's a real example. So again, one of the challenges around the smart meter rollout, yes, of course it is about the customer and enabling the customer to understand, but it's also about what interventions the DNO will need to make from a retail perspective in terms of the smart metering program. And again, something that we're very uh, aware of, and you'll, you'll have seen some examples of that in, the, in, a, in before. Uh, time of use tariffs, particularly uh, an interesting one for us. We have 1,200 time of use, and that's pure dynamic. So dynamic time shift, but also dynamic pricing on trial at the moment, uh, which is a fantastic place to be. So we started off at a reasonably low base in terms of what sort of pickup will we get? Will people be interested? But actually, our target was about 1,400, and we got 1,200 participants. So it's still statistically valid, which is a key thing for us, and actually enables us to trial uh, dynamic response from a premise of network intervention, network constraint, but also wind twinning or other low carbon energy forms uh, coming onto the network. So I'm particularly proud of that. The, the trial is still running. will run till the end of December this year. Uh, and customers receive either via text or via their in-home display a day ahead uh, price signal in terms of what the price tomorrow will be. And we're going from low to high, uh, high to low, low to mid mid to high, so we're trying out lots of different variations in terms of that time shift, price shift. Uh, and here's uh, one that I received. So this is what you see, this is what you get on your mobile phone, and you can see the smart meter of the future is actually an iPhone, in my view anyways, uh, in terms of the in-home display bit, which is a in-home, out-home display. Now where we get to a lot in the future will be interesting, but there it is in practice. So that's on my phone, and that is the signal I received for those day ahead interventions. And I have to say, the uptake from customers, there's definitely a shift. One, getting a smart meter in terms of uh, energy reduction, but also in terms of energy, energy usage patterns, but also in relation to time of use tariffs. Now, we can't publish any information at the moment because we don't want to prejudice our trials, but by the mid-year and by end of year, we'll be publishing a lot more detail about that. But needless to say, as far as I'm concerned, and I would say this as the product program director, but it is a success, and people are genuinely responding both to a smart meter, but also to a time of use tariff on that smart meter, which is good news. I won't dwell too much on this, but I just want to give you an insight. So you, uh, in London, we also have some EV trials, both from a use perspective, but also from an intervention perspective. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more later on about active network management. So we are trialing the actual active control of EV charging infrastructure. It's at early stages, and it's across a profile of, of a number of CNOs, that's charging network operators. But nonetheless, um, we're having relative success. So obviously, EV uptake isn't as much. Um, but the charging infrastructure in London, so we're approximately 1,200 units installed, backed by the Mayor Source London campaign, of course, which we are monitoring in terms of uh, impacts of that on the network. And then going on for the rest of this year, we'll also be doing interventions on some of that infrastructure, as well as installing some of our own charging infrastructure as UK power networks. Again, from a trial premise, but really looking at the future and what the future impact of that might be at scale, at different areas of the network in different postcodes, and of course the different modals of use that uh, residential and industrial customers and commercial customers will have. 
Uh, some examples, we've actually bought some of our own cars, which is a good place to start. So if you're going to demonstrate doing these types of things to our customers and our stakeholders, we have to walk the talk. So we've actually, we're standing up our own EV fleet, both from a, an operation perspective, but also from a, uh, a general employee use perspective also. And some examples there of installs of varying degrees of, of beauty, of course, and uh, you, you get this when you're doing these types of things. Uh, and again, I mentioned the regulating EV charge. I won't dwell on this because it's really in its infancy and the pack is there just to give you a bit of an, a bit of an influx. Um, we have about 100 vehicles, both residential and commercial. We have about 1,200, as I say, uh, charging infrastructure posts as part of the trials which we monitor and we, we're hoping to intervene on a number of those across the, across the landscape. And we also have about 30 vehicles uh, via EDF Energy for a real time of use trial for EVs. And again, we'll report more on that as the year goes on. Uh, small scale and better generation also fits. So I mentioned that our challenges around heat pumps. So we haven't had as many heat pump uh, trial participants as we would have liked, but that's, that's real, that's true. We're not going to manipulate or have a predetermined outcome for the trials. That's to do with the uptake of low carbon technology. You're probably all familiar about the, uh, the renewable heat incentive and the impacts that has. And we see that. And as a network operator, we have to plan and invest and optimize that investment. And if you plan ahead with X number of heat pumps and X number of other low-carbon technologies likely on the network, and actually you fall short. So there's an issue that we have to, as a DNO, get better at as well. Um, to stay with generation, so this is around an active network management trial. So London is a fault-constrained network, i.e. high fault level, so a lot of energy looking at a network. And what we want to be able to do is to allow generators to connect. But at the moment, because we don't really monitor a fault level, and we don't actively control those fault contributing devices, uh, we have an issue. So we want to get more intelligent. We, we want to be able to offer a smart connection to a generator. So instead of having a deep connection with deep connection charges and EHV reinforcement, can we monitor all of those fault contributors at any given time instantaneously to ensure that we can allow a connection, which is at least allowed to connect and export 80% of the time as opposed to none of the time or be constrained off. And that's what the active network management trials are all about. Currently, you have about 33 generators under trial, uh, which is both um, passive and active control of the generator. Of course, you've got to take customers on a journey. Not everyone's ready to allow us to take control of the output of that generator. And this is the journey that we have to take customers through for familiarization, awareness, and ensure that they're comfortable with the premise. But we are seeing relative levels of success. We are applying this to real network constraints. So we have a network constraint going on at the moment uh, in two areas of the network where we've actually used the program to call in real response from an active network managed premise, but also from a commercial demand response premise. So again, it reinforces what we're doing is actually real and, and organizations and customers will actually utilize it, which is good to see. Uh, and again, just some examples. So there is an element of technology involved in this and as an engineer, that's always good but actually it's more about familiarization of customers and installing new pieces of kit within customers' premises and how they react to that. So again, that's another challenge for us. Uh, demand response, again, uh, another area of our trial. So this is a commercial premise. So we are offering, uh, and some of you will be aware of this, of course, we are offering um, aggregated contracts via aggregators to customers to respond to a challenge that we might have in the network, but also to respond to pre-planned outages. So if we have a, an outage that we wish to take for construction or whatever purpose, we can't actually secure the next, for next circuit loss. We're actually using those contracts actively now at the moment as well as part of our trials to enable us to, to manage and plan the network. So again, we have about 24 megawatts of varying types and sizes under trial at the moment. This is under real commercial payment, a little bit higher than the National Grid store and definitely higher given the recent rounds of, uh, of store returns. But again, that's at the front, that's at the innovation curve. We're at the front of that curve, so you have to pay a little bit of a premium to get people engaged to create the market. And again, you would think in London, Lots of generation, lots of buildings, uh, lots of potential for demand response, but it is challenging. It is successful, but it is actually quite challenging. So we have generation, both diesel, uh, no gasps, low carbon diesel, it doesn't work out. Actually, if you do the sums, there is some science and some science to the method that actually that will and can give you benefit. CHP, but also building turndown. The big challenge of building turndown is occupation awareness. So people are who are there believe that they can sense that the heat has been turned down or the air condition has been turned off. So again, it's the whole premise around how you give out signals within a building and as a op building operator as to what you're going to do with that, uh, that demand. And that's a challenge for us. So building turned down, we've got about five megawatts in total. Obviously, the cost premise there, if you contract with two megawatts, it's one piece of kit for two megawatts of potential response. If you've got a series of 100 kilowatt or 500 kilowatt demands from buildings, 
uh, there's a bit of a different cost to that. So again, it's trying to work out which model best suits for what network constraint or planned outage you're trying to manage for. And again, it's putting all of the commercial wrapper around that. So you've got potentially different commercial constructs for each single customer. And again, it's trying to find out which one works best. Um, so network visibility is the key one I mentioned. It's a good challenge for us around the LV network. So we're, we're, we're looking at different ways of getting better visibility, both passive and active, and smart metering certainly plays into that, but also all the types of monitoring tools and what we call RTUs, remote terminal units and ring main units and how that's controlled. Uh, and again, our challenge with this was that we started within 10 low carbon zones in London. Um, we've actually consolidated on three, which are representative of our, of our network in London. And our premise there is to instrument those networks, both at LV and also at the HVLV boundary, uh, which we've done. And I'll show you some examples of that. And we will be trialling for the next 18 months um, how successful that is in terms of visibility, how that links in with our NMAC, our, our network control systems, how control engineers interact with that, what sort of kit do you need, at what cost, at what location. So do you instrument the whole of the network? Do you instrument certain nodes? And again, it's trying to discover and find out what is the optimum. And each premise will be different uh, with that. And state estimation fits within that. So this is the idea of, of, of using um, predetermined routines to understand whether or not you instrument all of the network or part of it. And we're really just starting that piece for the next 12 months to, to really get stuck into it. So just some examples. Uh, of course, not every substation is new and shiny. So we have obviously a, a reinforcement plan that goes with our LV substations, but we've got 200,000 of them in London that more or less look like this. So our plan is actually how do you retrofit? That's probably where more of the concentration is, as opposed to new equipment that actually has better facilities to install the new means of visualization, the new means of getting voltage, the new means of getting current, or whatever the case may be. So a bit of a challenge for us, we put a lot of effort into this, and also with the HSE, around how do you retrofit and install this kit within these substations. And again, uh, relative merits of success, but just again, some examples there. Um, for those of you who are interested, we're using the premise of insulated connections, so Rogowski coils. So again, not having an intervention, so to speak, on the LV network to actually get better visibility. Uh, not always successful, but, but uh, it's, a, it's a, um, uh, one of the options that we're looking at. So in summary, uh, how smart can we be? And again, I've, I've, I've got various versions of this slide. Um, so in terms of our trials, I mentioned we are two years into a program. So a lot of that was about systems, uh, the trials, the information that we need, the data that we need for, for Imperial College, who is our sort of learning partner. And again, we've, we've done a lot of work behind that, but also about getting smart meter data, because we're, as I say, we're not a retailer, we're a DNO, on the construct and the systems and the devices to get that information into us, managing all the data privacy aspects of that as well and data protection. And again, that's something that we'll, we'll need to consider in the future, and given where uh, we might end up with the uh, smart meter rollout program, that's not yet fixed from a DNO perspective as to what data comes from where, and do we need to have systems ourselves to deal with that data, or will the data come from, from other areas of the, of the business? Um, so we're in the data collection and trialing phase. We have a series of reports to get out next year, which will detail all of the things that we discover, both from a customer perspective, <laughs> from a, an uptake of low carbon technology, but also from a DNO perspective. So what can we rely upon? What can we use for network visibility? What could other DNOs in the UK use for network monitoring and control? And that will all be reported upon and shared with, with the fraternity, with the other DNOs, customers, and all other uh, interested and related parties. And again, knowledge gain must be transferred. So there's no part of us doing this as a program within our business. We have to make sure that once we do the program, and we are, that we involve all of aspects of our business, so that's operations, finance, legal, and all areas of the DNO fraternity that, that, that may need to get involved in a future scenario. Of course, that heavily includes the control engineers, and as you know, most of them are long in the tooth, and get them to change their ways and, and to do other things is an interesting journey. But once you get the message correct, mm. actually you find these guys come with you as quick as any, because they want an easier life, they want more visibility of the network, they want to understand where all the DG actually is, uh, what is the load flow? Is it that way or that way? And believe it or not, it's not all there at the moment. So whilst we may have some generation connected, we don't necessarily know whether it's true load or true demand. And again, these are some of the other things we're doing around visibility. Commercial innovation. So it's a whole new world for us as a DNO. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the presentation later, about what are the future steps for, for a DNO around commercial innovation. 
around business process innovation and around uh, customer engagement. So we have started off a massive piece around customer engagement, stakeholder engagement. Obviously, as a business, you would do that anyway, but to be prepared for and ready for real uh, again. Um, so all of these new technologies and commercial relationships all need to have a benefits case that sit behind them. And again, there's no point doing a program of this nature saying, yes, there's massive benefit here, but actually it costs too much. So again, there's a, there's a massive piece of work around that that we're doing uh, to try and ensure that what we propose as a program into our main business will actually fit within our smart strategy going forward. So the two things that we are bringing in today are demand response uh, and the smart metering information. So those are two things that we as a DNO are using today and will continue to use as part of our smart plan going forward into Rio. There are others that we are considering in other parts of the network, but specifically around the Low Carbon London project, those are the main areas. And of course, why would you do it? Uh, of course, we want to do it to ensure that we're ready for Rio, but also to ensure that it's the right thing to do. So that's me, and I'm happy to take some questions if, uh, if that's possible. Thanks, Liam. A, a, a couple of three questions have been posted, but if we get the roving mics going as well. Um, one of the first ones was, um, what level of granularity in consumer data is needed to maximise the value of DR, and where does this need to be held? At the DNO, the retailer, the home and the property? What's your view? So there's, there's two areas. There's obviously there's the residential premise and the commercial and industrial premise. I'll start with the, cost, the, uh, the commercial and industrial because it's easier um, <coughs> at this moment in time. So we have half hourly. Uh, we are installing new equipment to get more information from those sites. So it's not just enough to measure what a generator is doing or what the BEM system, the building and management system is doing. You need that in the context of the whole demand for that, that area and that site. We hold that. So it comes through from the aggregator. Uh, we have an agreement with customers, and we get that data and we store that data uh, and use the data as required. Now, there are some interfaces there, so is it best that the aggregator has current, that's the current model, and we've got three aggregators on the program. The fourth is actually ourselves, and we, we do behave and act as an aggregator to a certain extent, but only, only in, in uh, specific circumstances. So we hold that data and we've got that data, both in terms of consumption, uh, operation of those generators, or that build, building management system, and then we use that to manage our network. That gets linked into our control system, so it goes a straight link into NMAC, uh, which for those of you who are aware is the, is the tool more or less used by most DNOs to manage the network. Mm -hmm. In terms of residential, that's a whole new and a whole different ball game. So at the moment we have to operate, correctly so through an energy supplier. A DNO has a, has a sort of a right uh, to some of that data, but all has to be agreed up front. So at, at the outset I mentioned that our premise for the trials for smart meeting are opt-in. So with EDF Energy, we've, uh, we've used the opt-in model. So we ask a customer if they're okay for the DNO to have the data uh, via the energy retailer. And we have some of that data, but not all. So we don't associate uh, an N, uh, MPAN with an address. So again, we have to be mindful of the current situation with data and data flows. Um, we also have opt-out. So through British Gas, the model has been on an opt-out premise. And it's interesting to see the different impacts and the mm -hmm. different uh, feedback we get from those. Ultimately, it's an element of opt-in. So that, that's the more difficult one. Uh, the, the javelin hasn't landed yet in terms of where that data should be held. Uh, for those of you who are involved in the, in the SMETS uh, part two or specification two at the moment, you'll be aware of that that hasn't landed in terms of what data will actually be available, allowed to be available, and from what source. Um, we don't necessarily, uh, and I say this from a personal perspective as, uh, as more than a, from a DNO perspective, at this moment in time want all of that data. We don't know how much we actually need. Uh, we don't know um, how much of it's actually useful to us. So programs like this will give us a, a more of a flavour for what actually is most important. I think there's a couple of, uh, of subsid questions on that, on that same point. If I read them both out, uh, I, th I think you've, you've covered part of, of each of them, but there's some nice twists to it. DNOs have not previously been involved in demand response. Do they see themselves in the longer term offering this service as DNOs individually or in partnership with National Grid? First area. And the second, for smart meter trial, the volunteers are bound to be motivated to manage time of day use. How do you, as an invisible DNO, plan to manage the message to the masses and get wider engagement? Mm. Mm. So that the first one around uh, DNOs are new to demand response, actually not the case. So when I started the program, 
I went to our control and said, uh, can you give me any examples of whereby you've contracted with someone for demand response? And they've given me 16 examples in the last three years. Where due to a network constraint, our control room, and network operations, put in place an in-flight contract mm -hmm. with a generator to help us forward system relief. So actually, uh, you, you, and it's happened in other areas and other parts of the network as well. So I know Northern Power Grid have got examples of that, for instance. Um, will we offer it as an enduring service? Absolutely. It's actually baked in to our, uh, to our NAMP, that's a network asset management plan at the moment, and Ofgem do allow us that. But also it's baked in from a residential and from a commercial perspective, uh, an industrial perspective, uh, into our smart plans for real. So yes, we will, and yes, we are. Uh, it's, and again, it's all about risk swap. So if you're going to build your network and stick in a large transformer, which I love doing as an engineer, and invest in concrete and cables, that's there, it exists, it's there. If you put in demand response, it's actually not there. So it's, again, it's about the premise of risk swap. You're, you're swapping the risk of having it, it's there, but at a cost, or a cost to a customer, as opposed to trying to manage that in a smarter way. Um, in terms of the national grid question, just to pull this up, establish a multi-part multi DR contract with national grid and commercial aggregators. So again, that's a large part of the program. And for those of you who have been involved, there is a now a, a forum with National Grid and the DNOs around this in terms of what are the conflicts and synergies between Grid offering something for their purpose and the DNO offering something to potentially the same customer pool for some of the same purpose, but actually for some other purposes. So it wouldn't be smart uh, for the customer, and it wouldn't be right that, uh, that we enable that or allow that to happen. So what we're looking at is to understand, can one contract fit at all? But also in relation to the grid code, so in, again, some will know this, for 5 and 10% uh, uh, or 3 and 6% voltage reduction, which effectively was uh, demand response for 5 and 10% voltage or demand, um, that doesn't work anymore to the same extent as it used to. So again, there's a, there's a bit of work to be done around that. Uh, and the second one? I think you've covered both of them. Actually. Okay, good. that's fine.